God says to you, I know how you feel. What's your immediate reaction? I think for many of us, our immediate reaction is to feel a sense of comfort. We find comfort in the reminder that we're not alone in what we're going through, that someone else has been through it too, can know how we're feeling. But in many cases, I think this comfort's only temporary, and it soon fades to doubt. We start to question and wonder whether or not others actually know what we're going through, whether or not they actually get how we're feeling. I know this was true for me as a kid in grade school, watching my parents go through their separation. Some of my classmates would approach me and they'd say, hey, heard about your parents. That really sucks, I bet that's hard, but my parents got divorced too, so I know how you feel. And I did feel a sense of comfort in that. It was nice to know I wasn't the only kid going through this really tough and traumatic change in my family. But I found that as I continued to work through these feelings more on my own, I started to recognize that there were so many unique parts of my experience. Parts of my experience that my classmates could never understand, could never relate to. They didn't know how it felt to sit upstairs with my little brother, tears running down our faces as I'd cover his ears to muffle the sounds of my parents arguing downstairs. They didn't know how it felt to hear jokes about the reason my dad left being because he was a terrorist. They didn't know how it felt to walk into church as the only family led by just one parent, not to mention the fact that we were already one of the only families of color in the entire 1,200-person congregation. They didn't know how it felt at home, how stressed mom was all the time, working multiple jobs trying to make ends meet, while she also faced the barriers of not having a college education and being an immigrant who spoke English as her second language. They didn't know the real reasons my parents split up. They didn't know how I felt. Sure, they could understand and relate to how tough divorce is on a kid, but in their attempts to provide comfort, to empathize with the whole of what I was going through, I was actually left feeling more disconnected. The well-intended comments of my peers left me feeling more divided from them. And it wasn't until I was much older, much later in my life, that I was able to put words to the way that I had been feeling. And I began to understand why it was that I had been feeling that sense of disconnection from my peers. I started my undergraduate studies as a human services student, and I took a real interest in empathy. I wanted to know what true empathy meant, and what it looked like, and the role that it played in our day-to-day -day lives. I've since discovered how central empathy is to the way that we as humans see connection with one another. I've also discovered how powerful empathy has the potential to be. Which is why, after having studied empathy for a while now, I am absolutely convinced that a different interpretation and a different practice of empathy might actually change the world for the better. Because we're living in a world divided. We're living in a world divided by class, by race, by gender, by sexual orientation, by language, by religion, a world in which people are being oppressed and cast out on a daily basis because they're misunderstood, or maybe they just don't fit our version of the norm. We need a world in which we can meet each other in more genuine, compassionate, honest ways. And empathy, empathy that's properly understood and practiced is how I think we can get there. <coughs> I believe empathy shouldn't be about knowing how someone feels or claiming that we ever could know how someone feels, but that it should instead be about seeking a better understanding of how someone might feel. When many people talk about empathy or think about empathy or how we act out empathy, we talk about it as the act of putting ourselves in someone else's shoes, right? We use our shared and similar experiences to seek that connection with others. And we do so through verbal affirmations, like, I know how you feel, or when that happened to me. We believe this is how we're creating that legitimate connection with someone, by reassuring them that we get it. We've been through it too, so we know how they're feeling. And we do this to provide comfort, not only to that other person, but also to ourselves, right? Because in that moment, we want to feel as though we're helping that person work through their experience, work through those tough emotions that they might be going through. We also want to ease any tension and eliminate the potential for discomfort. And our intentions here are really good. We are still seeking that connection, and that is so wonderful. But we need to recognize that in practicing empathy in this way, we might be cutting people off in the middle of a sentence. 
In assuming that we know how someone feels, we might be washing over the real experiences, the real emotions of others. We might be discrediting the unique parts of their experience and unintentionally creating that divide, much like the divide that I felt for my classmates in grade school. Bottom line is, we eliminate the opportunity to really hear and really learn about how someone's feeling when we assume that we already know what those feelings are. So instead of seeing empathy as something we can do, this destination we can reach, an ability we can claim, I think we might be better seeing empathy as a more accurate term. This is going to sound really cheesy, but I think we might be better seeing empathy as this ongoing journey. This never-ending quest to seek a better understanding of others. Never a full understanding, simply a better one. I think it's about the power in saying, I don't know how you feel, and that's okay. But I'm here to listen without judgment so that I can learn and hear about your stories, your experience, the ways in which you engage with the world. It's recognizing that it's not at all about us in that moment. It's about the other person. As the listener, it's not about us. <coughs> We have a need to develop a genuine curiosity about others, a curiosity that allows individuals the space to share, freely, openly, comfortably, and that also allows listeners the space to learn. This is what I think empathy should look like. This is how I think we can achieve that meaningful connection that so many of us desperately want, but that I'd argue all of us so desperately need. Raise your hand if you've heard of the term intersectionality. Ooh, that's awesome. If you haven't heard of intersectionality, it's this fantastic idea that was coined during the second wave of feminism, essentially suggesting that as human beings, as individuals, we're comprised of a variety of parts and pieces and experiences that make us unique in our own right. It's a pretty watered down simplistic version, but I'll do for today. We can see looking up here how many parts really make up a person. Obviously, so many more than are even shown up here, but I think this is a great place to start. We see things like education, sexuality, ability, age, gender, ethnicity, and so on. All these parts that make up us, right, as an individual, that make us unique. And I think it's this component, intersectionality, that makes it impossible for us to ever truly know how someone else is feeling. Because I think in order to know how someone else feels, we have a need to understand all these parts of who they are. I think in order to empathize more deeply, we have to consider intersectionality. So when I talk about seeing empathy as this quest for a better understanding of others, this is what I'm talking about. We have a need to have more hard, difficult, challenging conversations about things like class and our family backgrounds and culture and race Conversations that ask us to leave our comfort zones. We need to get comfortable with discomfort, comfortable with acknowledging that we don't know how others are feeling, but that we're simply there to step back and listen and learn. These conversations are extremely difficult, not only because of that discomfort that's caused by them, but also because they ask us to be extremely intentional. Right? These conversations ask us to be extremely vulnerable, and they ask us to be great active listeners, which we all know can be hard. <laughs> but I think that this is the only way we can really achieve a better understanding of others. The discomfort we feel about having these conversations stems from what I think is two primary barriers. The first of these barriers being stereotypes and biases. We all make assumptions about the ways that we think people will think or act or feel based on things like religious affiliation or political affiliation or skin color or the way they dress or the way they talk. But it's these biases and assumptions that make it impossible for us to really listen openly and without judgment to others. We need to replace these biases with that curiosity I talked about, that genuine curiosity about one another, about the diversity of humanity. The second barrier I think we face is privilege. Understanding the privilege we have or don't have relative to others, whether that's based on our education, or where we grew up, or our class, or our race, can make having these conversations really tough because there's a certain power balance suggested there. 
It's a power balance that makes us want to say, I'm out, I'm not having this conversation, this is uncomfortable for me, I'd rather not. But until we start having these hard conversations that ask us to get comfortable with discomfort, how can we truly learn about others? Until we start having these hard conversations, how can we eliminate the divides in society grounded in the misunderstanding of others? We have a need to have more of these tough, real conversations to achieve that real connection with others. So I'll say it again. Empathy shouldn't be about knowing how someone feels. It should instead be about seeking a better understanding of how others might feel. Imagine a world where this kind of empathy was second nature. A world where we all respected the diversity of one another. What would that look like? I like to think that in this new world, we would see more diverse and supportive neighborhoods and communities. I like to think that we would see an increase in compassion worldwide. And I like to think that we might even eventually see the elimination of racism, of sexism, of classism. I think in this new world, we'd live together more harmoniously, more peacefully. I know this might sound like a lofty goal, and I will be the first to admit that I can be overly optimistic at times. But I think this world is absolutely possible. I think we can achieve this world by practicing empathy in a way that centers around recognizing our diversity, a way that centers around having a genuine curiosity about others. It's in getting comfortable with discomfort, comfortable with having those hard conversations that we allow ourselves to open our hearts and open our minds and open our ears and really hear about the experiences of others. This is how I think empathy can change the world. This is how I think we can change the world together. Thank you.